One night he lost even more heavily than usual. I was sitting in my hut when he and Captain Morstan came stumbling along on the way to their quarters. They were bosom friends, those two, and never far apart. The Major was raving about his losses. It's all up, Morstan, he was saying as they passed my hut. I shall have to send in my papers. I'm a ruined man. Nonsense, old chap, said the other, slapping him upon the shoulder. I've had a nasty facer myself, but... That's all I could hear, but it was enough to set me thinking. A couple of days later, Major Sholto was strolling on the beach, so I took the chance of speaking to him. I wish to have your advice, Major, said I. Well, Small, what is it? he asked, taking the cheroot from his lips. I wanted to ask you, sir, said I, who is the proper person to whom hidden treasures should be handed over? I know where half a million worth lies, and as I cannot use it myself, I thought perhaps the best thing that I could do would be to hand it over to the proper authorities, and then perhaps they would get my sentence shortened for me. Half a million small, he gasped, looking hard at me to see if I was in earnest. Quite that, sir, in jewels and pearls. It lies there ready for anyone, and the queer thing about it is that the real owner is outlawed and cannot hold property so that it belongs to the first comer. To, to government, small, he stammered, to government. But he said it in a halting fashion, and I knew in my heart that I had got him. You think then, sir, that I should give the information to the governor general? said I quietly. Well, well, you must not do anything rash or that you might r r repent. Uh, let me hear all about it, Small. Give me the facts. I told him the whole story with small changes so that he could not identify the places. When I had finished, he stood stock still and full of thought. I could see by the twitch of his lip that there was a struggle going on within him. This is a very important matter, Small, he said at last. You must not say a word to anyone about it, and I shall see you again soon. Two nights later, he and his friend Captain Morstan came to my hut in the dead of night with a lantern. I want you to let Captain Morstan hear that story from your own lips, Small, said he. I repeated it as I had told it before. It rings true, eh? said he. It's good enough to act upon. Captain Morstan nodded. Look here, Small, said the Major. We've been talking it over, my friend here and I, and we have come to the conclusion that this secret of yours is hardly a government matter after all, but it's a private concern of your own, which, of course, you have the power of disposing of as you think best. Now, the question is, what price would you ask for it? Uh, we might be inclined to uh, take it up and at least look into it if we could agree as to terms. He tried to speak in a cool, careless way, but his eyes were shining with excitement and greed. Why, as to that, gentlemen, I answered, trying also to be cool, but feeling as excited as he did. There is only one bargain which a man in my position can make. I shall want you to help me to my freedom, and to help my three companions to theirs. We shall then take you into partnership and give you a fifth share to divide between you. Huh, said he, a fifth share. That is not very tempting. It would come to fifty thousand apiece, said I. But how can we gain your freedom? You know very well that you ask an impossibility. Nothing of the sort, I answered. I have thought it all out to the last detail. The only bar to our escape is that we can get no boat fit for the voyage, and no provisions to last us for so long a time. There are plenty of little yachts and yawls at Calcutta or Madras which would serve our turn well. Do you bring one over? We shall engage to get aboard her one night, and if you will drop us off at any part of the Indian coast, you will have done your part of the bargain. If there were only one, he said. None or all, I answered. We have sworn it. The four of us must always act together. You see, Morstan, said he. Small as a man of his word. He does not flinch from his friend. I think we may very well trust him. It is a dirty business, the other answered. Yet, as you say, the money would save our commissions handsomely. Well, Small, said the Major, we must, I suppose, try and meet you. We must first, of course, test the truth of your story. Tell me where the box is hid. 
and I shall get leave of absence and go back to India in the monthly relief boat to inquire into the affair. Not so fast, said I, growing colder as he got hot. I must have the consent of my three comrades. I tell you that it is four or none with us. Nonsense, he broke in. What have three black fellows to do with our agreement? Black or blue, said I. They are in with me, and we all go together. Well, the matter ended by a second meeting, at which Mahomet, Singh, Abdullah Khan, and Dost Akbar were all present. We talked the matter over again, and at last we came to an arrangement. We were to provide both the officers with charts of the parts of the Agra fort and mark the place in the wall where the treasure was hid. Major Sholto was to go to India to test our story. If he found the box, he was to leave it there, to send out a small yacht provisioned for a voyage, which was to lie off Rutland Island, and to which we were to make our way, and finally to return to his duties. Captain Mawson was then to apply for leave of absence to meet us at Agra, and there we were to have the final division of the treasure, he taking the Major's share as well as his own. All this we sealed by the most solemn oaths that the mind could think or the lips utter. I sat up all night with paper and ink, and by the morning I had two charts already signed with the sign of the four, that is, of Abdullah, Akbar, Mehmet, and myself. Well, gentlemen, I weary you with my long story, and I know that my friend Mr. Jones is impatient to get me safely stowed in Choki. I'll make it as short as I can. The villain Sholto went off to India, but he never came back again. Captain Morstan showed me his name among a list of passengers in one of the mail boats very shortly afterwards. His uncle had died, leaving him a fortune, and he had left the army, yet he could stoop to treat five men as he had treated us. Morstan went over to Agra shortly afterwards and found, as we expected, that the treasure was indeed gone. The scoundrel had stolen it all, without carrying out one of the conditions on which we had sold him the secret. From that day, I lived only for vengeance. I thought of it by day and I nursed it by night. It became an overpowering, absorbing passion with me. I cared nothing for the law, nothing for the gallows. To escape, to track down Sholto, to have my hand upon his throat, that was my one thought. Even the Agra treasure had come to be a smaller thing in my mind than the slaying of Sholto. Well... I have set my mind on many things in this life, and never one which I did not carry out. But it was weary years before my time came. I have told you that I had picked up something of medicine. One day, when Dr. Somerton was down with a fever, a little Andaman Islander was picked up by a convict gang in the woods. He was sick to death, and had gone to a lonely place to die. I took him in hand, though he was as venomous as a young snake. And after a couple of months, I got him all right and able to walk. He took a kind of fancy to me then, and would hardly go back to his woods, but was always hanging about my hut. I learned a little of his lingo from him, and this made him all the fonder of me. Tonga, for that was his name, was a fine boatman, and owned a big, roomy canoe of his own. When I found that he was devoted to me and would do anything to serve me, I saw my chance of escape. I talked it over with him. He was to bring his boat round on a certain night to an old wharf which was never guarded, and there he was to pick me up. I gave him directions to have several gourds of water and a lot of yams, coconuts, and sweet potatoes. He was staunch and true, was little Tonga. No man ever had a more faithful mate. At the night named, he had his boat at the wharf. As it chanced, however, there was one of the convict guard down there, a vile pathan who had never missed a chance of insulting and injuring me. I had always vowed vengeance, and now I had my chance. It was as if fate had placed him in my way that I might pay my debt before I left the island. He stood on the bank with his back to me and his carbine on his shoulder. I looked about for a stone to beat out his brains with, but none could I see. Then... A queer thought came into my head and showed me where I could lay my hand on a weapon. I sat down in the darkness and unstrapped my wooden leg. With three long hops I was on him. He put his carbine to his shoulder, but I struck him full and knocked the whole front of his skull in. 
You can see the split in the wood now where I hid him. We both went down together, for I could not keep my balance, but when I got up I found him still lying quiet enough. I made for the boat, and in an hour we were well out at sea. Tonga had brought all his earthly possessions with him, his arms and his gods. Among other things, he had a long bamboo spear and some Andaman coconut matting with which I made a sort of sail. For ten days we were beating about, trusting to luck, and on the eleventh we were picked up by a trader which was going from Singapore to Jeddah with a cargo of Malay pilgrims. They were a rum crowd, and Tonga and I soon managed to settle down among them. They had one very good quality. They let you alone and asked no questions. Well, if I were to tell you all the adventures that my little chum and I went through, you would not thank me, for I would have you here until the sun was shining. Here and there we drifted about the world, something always turning up to keep us from London. All the time, however, I never lost sight of my purpose. I would dream of Sholto at night. A hundred times I have killed him in my sleep. At last, however, some three or four years ago, we found ourselves in England. I had no great difficulty in finding where Sholto lived, and I set to work to discover whether he had realized the treasure or if he still had it. I made friends with someone who could help me. I name no names, for I don't want to get anyone else in a hole, and I soon found that he still had the jewels. Then I tried to get at him in many ways, but he was pretty sly, and had always two prize fighters besides his son and his Kitmugar on guard over him. One day, however, I got word he was dying. I hurried at once to the garden, mad that he should slip out of my clutches like that, and, looking through the window, I saw him lying in his bed with his sons on either side of him. I'd have come through and taken my chance with the three of them, only even as I looked at him his jaw dropped and I knew that he was gone. I got into his room that same night though, and I searched his papers to see if there was any record of where he had hidden our jewels. There was not a line, however, so I came away bitter and savage as a man could be. Before I left, I bethought me that if I ever met my Sikh friends again, it would be a satisfaction to know that I had left some mark of our hatred. So I scrawled down the sign of the four of us as it had been on the chart, and I pinned it onto his bosom. It was too much that he should be taken to the grave without some token from the men whom he had robbed and befooled. We earned a living at this time by my exhibiting poor Tonga at fairs and other such places as the Black Cannibal. He would eat raw meat and dance his war dance, so we always had a hatful of pennies after a day's work. I still heard all the news from Pondicherry Lodge, and for some years there was no news to hear except that they were hunting for the treasure. At last, however, came what we had waited for so long. The treasure had been found. It was up at the top of the house, in Mr. Bartholomew Sholto's chemical laboratory. I came at once and had a look at the place, but I could not see how, with my wooden leg, I was to make my way up to it. I learned, however, about a trap door in the roof, and also about Mr. Sholto's supper hour. It seemed to me that I could manage the thing easily through Tonga. I brought him out with me with a long rope round his waist. He could climb like a cat, and he soon made his way through the roof, but, as ill luck would have it, Bartholomew Sholto was still in the room to his cost. Tonga thought that he had done something very clever in killing him, for when I came up by the rope I found him strutting about as proud as a peacock. Very much surprised was he when I made at him with the rope's end and cursed him for a little bloodthirsty imp. I took the treasure box and let it down, and then slid down myself, having first left the sign of the four upon the table to show that the jewels had come back at last to those who had the most right to them. Tonga then picked up the rope, closed the window, and made off the way that he had come. I don't know that I have anything else to tell you. I had heard a waterman speak of the speed of Smith's launch, the Aurora, so I thought she would be a handy craft for our escape. I engaged with old Smith and was to give him a big sum if he got us safe to our ship. He knew, no doubt, that there was some screw loose, but he was not in our secrets. All this is the truth, 
And if I tell it to you, gentlemen, it is not to amuse you, for you have not done me a very good turn. But it is because I believe the best defense I can make is just to hold back nothing. And let all the world know how badly I have myself been served by Major Sholto, and how innocent I am of the death of his son. A very remarkable account, said Sherlock Holmes. A fitting wind-up to an extremely interesting case. There is nothing at all new to me in the latter part of your narrative, except that you brought your own rope. That I did not know. By the way, I had hoped that Tonga had lost all his darts, yet he managed to shoot one at us in the boat. He had lost them all, sir, except the one which was in his blowpipe at the time. Ah, of course, said Holmes. I had not thought of that. Is there any other point which you would like to ask about? Asked the convict affably. I think not, thank you, my companion answered. Well, Holmes, said Athelney Jones, you are a man to be humoured, and we all know that you are a connoisseur of crime, but duty is duty, and I have gone rather far in doing what you and your friend asked me. I shall feel more at ease when we have our storyteller here safe under lock and key. The cub still waits, and there are two inspectors downstairs. I am much obliged to you both for your assistance. Of course, you will be wanted at the trial. Good night to you. Good night, gentlemen both, said Jonathan Small. You first, Small, remarked the wary Jones as they left the room. I'll take particular care that you don't club me with your wooden leg, whatever you may have done to the gentleman at the Underman Isles. Well, and there is the end of our little drama, I remarked after we had sat some time smoking in silence. I fear that it may be the last investigation into which I shall have the chance of studying your methods. Miss Morstan has done me the honour to accept me as a husband in prospective. He gave her most dismal groan. Oh, I feared as much, said he. I really cannot congratulate you. I was a little hurt. Have you any reason to be dissatisfied with my choice? I asked. Oh, none at all. I think she is one of the most charming young ladies I have ever met, and might have been most useful in such work as we have been doing. She had a decided genius that way. Witness the way in which she preserved that Agra plan from all the other papers of her father. But love is an emotional thing. And whatever is emotional is opposed to that true cold reason which I place above all things. I should never marry myself lest I bias my judgment. I trust, said I, laughing, that my judgment may survive the ordeal. But you look weary. Yes, the reaction is already upon me. I shall be as limp as a rag for a week. Strange, said I. How terms of what in another man I should call laziness alternates with your fits of splendid energy and vigor. Yes, he answered. There are in me the makings of a very fine loafer, and also of a pretty spry sort of fellow. I often think of those lines of old Goethe. Schade das die Natur nur einen Mensch aus der Schuf, der zum Rödigen Mann war und zum Schelmen der Stoff. Uh, by the way, apropos of this Norwood business, you see that they had, as I surmised, a confederate in the house, who could be none other than Lal Rao, the butler. So Jones actually has the undivided honour of having caught one fish in his great hall. The division seems rather unfair, I remarked. You have done all the work in this business. I get a wife out of it. Jones gets the credit. Pray, what remains for you? For me, said Sherlock Holmes. There still remains the cocaine bottle. And he stretched his long white hand up for it. You've been listening to a Steve Parker Audiobooks production. For more content, please visit steveparkeraudiobooks.com or find us on YouTube.